everyone. I'm Frank Malacone. I'm a news anchor for KTVU Fox 2 here in the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest today is a certified financial planner and the author of the new book called How Money Works, Stop Being a Sucker. And he's here to talk about your holiday spending habits in the midst of COVID, among other things. Let's say hi to Steve Seabold. Steve, how are you? Hey, good, Frank. Thanks. Good to have you with us. Uh, well, uh, I guess the first question is, how do we stop being a sucker? <laughs> because well, I am one at times. Well, so many of us have been because we're not really taught how money works in school. And that's why we wrote this book, How Money Works, Stop Being a Sucker, just because the, the, the financial institutions have been taking, taking advantage of the American public for 150 years, and most people don't really know it. So we wrote this book on a 14-year-old on level so people could really understand it, even if they had very little education in the subject area. I don't think people realize the relationship with money. I mean, it affects everything you do, doesn't it really? It sure does. It sure does. It affects the way you sleep. I mean, if you're worried about money, it affects all your decision making. I mean, it really, you know, money might not make you happy, but it certainly gives you a lot of options and it makes life a lot easier. Well, let's talk about the holidays. Um, out of the gate, uh, I'm a, a bit of a giver and sometimes I don't set a budget and uh, sometimes that gets me into trouble. But um, uh, First thing out of the gate is, uh, I guess, the emotion of the season. A lot of people get caught up in it, want to, well, get Aunt Mary this, my mom that, and uh, maybe you need to take a step back. Hey, you're totally right. I mean, Madison Avenue knows how to manipulate the American public like really no one else. I mean, they play the songs. It's a, it's a whole emotional thing they create. And we, it's really easy to get caught up in it. And I've done it my whole life as well. It's, and you start thinking, well, I, can, I can't really afford to purchase this present, but I really want to do it because I really care about this person. And it really can't, you can't let, you can't let your emotions run wild when it comes to, unless you can afford it, when it comes to the holidays, you really got to keep them in check. And then your family tears through it anyways. Okay, what's for dinner? And tomorrow you wake up, it's all over and you go, Oh, I've got all these bills to pay. Um, how about a budget? If you're heading out, um, you can spend X, but not X plus Y. Definitely. I would say not only a budget, but a cash budget. Forget credit cards. Keep it in cash and only spend what you can afford to spend. Spend. As a matter of fact, I would, I would spend below you know, what you can afford to spend and tell people this is, a, I mean, we're in a pandemic. I mean, who knows what the economy is going to do? You don't want to end up with a bunch of credit card bills at 24% interest, you know, in January. Absolutely. And with COVID, um, you know, a lot of deals out there now, they want to entice you to buy stuff. You got Black Friday coming up and we, Cyber Monday, we went through um, very tempting out there. So you got to be aware that uh, they're trying to kind of suck you in, so to speak. They're trying to, and they, it works every single year. I mean, you've seen it just like I've, I have, Frank, where they people fight over toys and things and all kinds of, they line up at four in the morning it, this manipulation, they're very, very good at it and, it, and it works. And unfortunately, we end up being the suckers that are, uh, that are pulled into this, this, uh, this manipulation. We really need to shut it down. And you talk about being honest with yourself. What do you mean by that? Honest in terms of what you can afford. And I think honest with yourself, but also your, your kids, if you have small kids especially, to let them know, hey, this is the way the world works. I mean, if, you, if you're rich and you have nothing but money, then fine. But, it, but most of us are not. And so this is what you have to do to, uh, to be financially solvent and financially responsible. You've got to make sure you can only spend what you can afford. Can you use a credit card if you can pay it off? If you can pay it off and it's just a convenience thing, I mean, that's what the wealthy do. I mean, they use cards just because they're a convenience, but of course they pay them off every single month. But if you're carrying a, a debt load, you certainly don't want to add to it. Yeah. And uh, a lot of charities come calling. This is uh, kind of their big time of the year as well, needing help. And, and you say, you know, give a little, but not a lot, especially if you don't have much to give, I guess. Yeah, if you've got a lot to give, that's fantastic. But really, the wealthy are the people with the, with the extra money that fund all the charities in this country. And unfortunately, a lot of people that can't afford it give way more than they can, and they end up becoming part of the charity because, uh, because of just emotional thinking. And we've got to use our logic when it comes to uh, when it comes to the subject. Do you think we can develop new spending habits because of COVID? We're kind of all kind of stuck at home and that kind of thing. And uh, if you're not going to spend a lot, maybe that'll transpire year after year where you kind of say, hey, we'll get together for dinner and maybe a small gift, but we don't have to go nuts. 
Exactly. And I think you're right. I think we can develop new habits, especially because we all we, we all know now what what's really important. I mean, we I think we all got a, a wake up call um, in terms of what's important to family and friends and relationships. It's not what it's not what you give or the level of spending that you, uh, you know, that you that you go to during the holidays. It's really about togetherness. And I think we probably all gotten a lesson of that this year. But maybe too much, actually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, what about family? We set parameters, you know, I'm older, my sister and brother are older now, they all have kids, we used to give, give, give. And, uh, you know, my sister finally said, and she's saying, she says, wait a minute, you know, I'll buy Mark a gift, you buy me a gift, and he can buy such and such. But a lot of times, people break the rules. What do you say to them? You know, like, wow, you bought me four things, and I only bought you, you know, a pair of socks. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I know this can be a problem. I've run into this in my own family for sure. Yeah. I, I think that, again, I think it comes down to being honest with people and leveling people, not that they care. I mean, why would they care? You know, they, they'd rather see a financially solvent than worried about money after you bought them something you can't afford. So I think it's about being honest with the people around you. Yeah. What is it about money? Why are we afraid to talk about it? Even, uh, you know, when a, a couple gets married, it's a big part of the relationship, uh, who pays the bills and all that kind of thing. But sometimes people are, you know, they just can't talk about it. No question. Well, we're not taught about it in schools, like we talked about, not even in college or university. And we might learn how to write a check. Of course, who writes a check anymore? But they don't really, it's, it's not required. Sex ed is required in a lot of states. You know, financial literacy is not. But I think part of it also, Frank, is that, you know, we, we're, we're taught in this country a lot of times, I think most of us, that money is the root of all evil and it's for narcissists and people that are greedy and people that are rich or wealthy or independently, you know, financially independent are somehow of some kind of gained this, you know, gamed the system or are crooks. And none of those things are true. It's just, it's just what we're programmed to believe. And I think we need to start having more honest educational type of conversations about the topic. I know. I remember when I went to Cal my first year, I got a, you know, got a checking account and my mom said, you don't know what you're doing here. got my first couple of credit cards and uh, they don't really teach a lot of the common sensible things that, uh, that we all need. I, I have a few friends that are doctors. They come out, but part of being a doctor is being a good businessman, getting the right real estate, hiring the right people, a bookkeeper. Um, it, it all revolves around money. Absolutely. I mean, just like, like the, the one of the concepts we teach in the book is the rule 72. And it really is just like a mental math shortcut for people who don't know it to determine how long it takes $1 that you invest or save to turn into $2. So for example, most of the banks now you're getting maybe, you know, 0.01% or maybe point, I think the average in this country right now is 0 0.09, you know, which means your, your money takes 800 years to double. And then they give you a credit card at 17% that you spend on. And then their money doubles every four years and yours doubles every eight, you know, depending on the rate, you know, 800 years or 7,200 years if it's 0.01%. So we need to learn these things in school or learn it as adults. So we're not being ripped off by the financial industry. Tell us more about your book. Uh, apparently I thumbed through it quickly, but it, it's pretty simple, right? It's a quick read. Yeah, we, we, I wrote it with a gentleman named Tom Matthews who's a 40 year veteran in the financial industry. And we, we really wanted a book that, a 14 year old kid could read and understand and if they were so inclined could implement. And I think that's why it's it sold almost a half a million copies this year alone. It's the number one selling financial uh, book of, of 2020. And I think it's because it's so simple that anyone can understand it and really take action. And if they read this book and implement it, it's the only financial book they'd ever need to read. Yeah, and what kind of reaction, I know you were at a book signing in Georgia uh, just moments ago. Uh, what do people say? What are they? Thank you, or my God, you've changed my life, or what? They're excited about it, I think, because they can understand it. I mean, that's that's the the feeling we get everywhere we go, even during the shutdown, is that they they finally there's finally the old joke with financial books is the only people that can understand them are the people that write them or the financial industry, and because they they talk in code and it's it's a very sophisticated topic. But if you break it down to its essence and just give people what they really need, we're not talking about teaching people, you know, how to trade derivatives on Wall Street. You know, right. we're talking about just basic personal finance that if you know these things and you implement them, you really don't have to do anything else. Yeah, my grandparents, when I was, uh, you know, pushing 20 said, say, if it's five bucks a week, it'll add up. And I, I read a book called The Latte Factor. Have you heard that? Where you, you kind of pay yourself forward and instead of getting that, uh, you know, that Starbucks coffee and a muffin every day, put it away. And at 22, by the time you're 65, and if you put it in the right area, you could have over a million bucks. 
Absolutely. It's a compound interest is uh, like Einstein said, it's, it's the eighth wonder of the world. It's just once you understand how it actually works, and most people don't really know, uh, you just you can you never really do the same things with your money. How do you teach a young person about saving? Because when you're young, you don't care. When you're old, you're like, God, wish I had done that. I think maybe teaching them one of the things we talk about in the book is called the time value of money. Basically, the, how, how money can grow, as you just said, with the latte factor, how it can grow over a period of years. That time is really the key, the key thing. Like you're saying, you put a small amount of money, like we have a, something called the million dollar baby we talk about in the book. So if someone invests $13,000, roughly at six and a half percent for 67 years, leaves it in there, the, the, the child, now the 67 year old adult, retires a millionaire. In some cases, far over a million dollars, depending on the rate of return. It's just amazing what compound interest can do. I should have read your book about 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah, me too. I wish it was out. I would, yeah, me and you, you and me both. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny how you, how you get older, you get wiser. That's for sure, especially uh, when it comes to money. Um, well, would you like to share? How do people get in touch? How do they get the book? They can, they can get the book on Amazon, of course, or they can go to howmoneyworks.com. Uh, All right. Well, that's Steve Siebold. Uh, how Money Works. Uh, stop being a sucker. It's out there right now. Steve, I uh, want to thank you. I know you've been busy today. So thanks for the time here at Fox. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Frank. I appreciate it. All right. I'm Frank Malicote. If you'd like more information, you go to newsnowfox.com as well. Have a good day, everybody.